This is Basic Skills for Pruning Grapevines, Grape Video 21. In this video, we're going to cover five or six of the fundamental concepts and skills that you will need to properly prune grapevines. Without these skills, you won't have a complete idea of how to proceed when you walk up to a grapevine with your pruning shears. This video will take a while, so be patient. If you need a break, put the computer on pause or start it over tomorrow or the next day, but take your time to get a full understanding of the five different aspects of pruning that we present in this video. When you have this in mind, you'll be all set to proceed to the next step of pruning grapevines. Let's talk about how you would go about learning to use a frying pan in the kitchen. You know, if you have never used a frying pan at all, there, there are no directions in the cookbooks like for a recipe that says put this recipe in the oven at 400 degrees for 35 minutes. Now, when you use a frying pan, it's kind of a touchy-feely thing. And we could start to teach you how to use a frying pan by saying things like, well, you've got to be very careful at what temperature you start cooking things, and you just don't turn everything on high. And sometimes you'll need to put a cover on that frying pan when you want to simmer things. And what kind of frying pan are you going to use? Is it going to be a relatively inexpensive thin aluminum pan or is it going to be a nice heavy thick copper bottom pan or is it going to have a coating on it that prevents things from sticking and what are you going to add are you going to add oil before you start cooking are you going to use a a spray uh spray oil and we could talk about some of the basics of using a frying pan but you're really not going to learn how to use that frying pan until you actually do it on the stove. Well, we want to tell you that this video is going to give you some basic skills of pruning, but you're not going to know how to prune when you get finished with this video. You're going to have some of the skills in mind, how to go about it. And in later videos, we're actually going to go through the steps in the vineyard to show you one, two, three pruning and you will already know the concepts of pruning that you learned in this video. This video is going to take about an hour to watch, so you might lose patience. So if you want to watch it for a few minutes and then start it over or take a pause, go right ahead and do that. But we need to take a certain amount of time to give you the basic skills of pruning and then be assured in a later video we'll apply those to the actual task of pruning just like you would go to the stove to learn the actual skill of cooking with a frying pan. Good luck. If you're shooting archery, you won't hit the target if you don't have a target. And that's the same situation when pruning grapevines. If you don't have a target, if you don't have an idea of what you're doing when you're pruning, you don't have a goal of what the vine should look like when you're finished pruning, you obviously can't get it right. If you just go out with the pruning shears and start chopping away at the vine, you have no target. So that's why we presented 14 different videos before this one on targets for mature grapevines. We call those targets grapevine training systems and we began talking about those in grape video 6 when we presented the principles of grapevine training. So if your interest is in pruning mature full-size grapevines you either have to have that target in mind already or we would greatly encourage you to review Grape Video 6 and as many of the 
other videos on grapevine training. That's grape videos 7 through 19 to get your target in mind for what you want to do to prune that mature grapevine. Now, if you're pruning young vines, new vines, abandoned vines, vines that have been winter injured, vines that are only one or two years old, no problem because in the videos after this one, we will present all those situations and help you through the process of pruning grapevines in various conditions. But if it's a mature grapevine and you're wondering what type of training system do I use, you need to resolve that first before you start to go through the process of pruning. Well, let's start out with the very basics again of the grapevine. This is a grape cane. This is the node, or as we often call it, a bud, but correctly a node along the cane. And if you're not up to speed on the terminology of grapevines, we suggest that you see grape videos one to three for a review of terminology before moving on with this particular video. Well, when we have that cane and we have that node and it starts to grow in the spring, this is what happens. Along that cane, from those node areas, come shoots with clusters on them like this. Oftentimes there's just one shoot Many times there can be two, which growers sometimes call doubles, and on occasion, even all three buds inside that node will develop into three shoots, but that's a rarity. But when we think of growth on a grapevine, where does it come from? We're primarily thinking of the buds in the nodes, on the canes, which are the smooth bark parts of the vine after uh, the vine has gone dormant, the only smooth bark parts of the vine are the canes. And so when we prune, we're very mindful of canes and the nodes on them. But there's other kinds of buds on the vines that we've covered in previous videos. And we call those base buds. Why? Because they're located at the base of canes, as shown here with a number of base buds located where there have been pruning cuts and at the base of canes that have been pruned off years ago or just in recent years. These base buds are quite small. And they're not very showy and they're not very noticeable. But they can produce shoots just like the nodes on canes. And that's important to know for the grower. Why? Because the way we make pruning cuts and the way they're made on the grapevines has an influence on where and how many shoots develop on a grapevine. And that's quite important because if we want to prune so that we expect 40 shoots to grow on a grapevine, we don't want to wind up having 80 or 100 grow, or we will have an excess of shoots. We will have an excess shoot density that changes the whole way the vine performs, and we don't want too many shoots on the vine, and we influence that greatly by the way we prune the vine. Let's explain further. Here are two pictures of pruning cuts made on vines. The one on the left we have said are rough pruning cuts that have left or leave many base buds. As you can see, I can see at least six. There's probably more like 12 base buds in that complex because when we prune that 
section of the vine. We left short stubs and those base buds are there to grow either in the next year or they can be dormant and come out years later. In contrast, the cuts made on the right were made quite flush to the trunk on which they occur and we've pruned off many of the base buds really all that we can see but there may still be some very small base buds that will lay there but we've done a good job of getting most of the base buds off by pruning nice and clean and we are not going to be surprised and disappointed with a lot of extra growth in the spring from this portion of the vine because we did a nice clean pruning cut. Let's show examples of what happens with base buds. Now we have put a red blotch where there had been a cane growing on what is probably about a three-year-old arm and around that cane where it was pruned off there were base buds and at least two of them grew out to produce the long canes that you see with yellow marks along them. We didn't intend to do that when we pruned necessarily. Those canes came out and at the base of that one cane on the right, right where the yellow line ends, there is now a base bud at the base of that cane. So we can get a lot of growth from pruning cuts, from base buds, if we're not careful. And that means we will have a lot of work to clean up the vine of extraneous shoot growth when it begins in the in the spring. So much so that at times those base buds at various pruning cuts along a big old cordon like this they can contribute to a crowded condition. We didn't intend to have so many shoots grow along this cordon and create all this congested growth. No, but it happened because base buds from pruning cuts keep throwing out more and more shoots, more than we actually want. So keep that in mind when you prune that the way you prune the grapevine is going to have a huge influence on what actually grows the next spring. As friends would tell me, and I now tell you, don't be a dirty pruner. Learn to make nice, clean pruning cuts and do that consistently. If you fall off the wagon, if you get lazy at times, try your best to get back on track to make those good, nice, clean pruning cuts and you'll be glad you did and you'll be well rewarded when the vine grows out in the spring and it grows the way you would like it to. Okay, we go back to a picture of a cane that we showed in an earlier video with the nodes along the cane. And we're going to talk about what happens when we prune out a cane for fruiting with some of the training systems that we have already talked about that use long cane pruning for fruiting. Okay, what happens when we prune on a cane? Several things, several options can be had. We may prune that cane to a cane that has five or more nodes on it. 
and when that occurs by definition we do call the remaining cane on the vine a cane. Now there are various canes that we develop on the vine for various purposes. One of those is a fruiting cane. If it's our intention to keep a cane on the vine with five or more nodes for the purpose, the main purpose of creating fruiting capacity, we would call that a fruiting cane. This is a schematic of umbrella niffin training that we presented in Grape Video 11. And you can see the long canes that are arched up over a wire and back down and tied, and hence the name umbrella, because it kind of has that shape of an umbrella. And when we do that, those long canes, their primary function is fruiting, and those are then called fruiting canes. And here's a picture of some of those long canes as they existed back in 1974 in Clois Pinio's vineyard up on what the local folks in the Branchport, New York area of the Finger Lakes would call the pinnacle. This is up on the pinnacle looking down and these long canes arched over the wires are fruiting canes and many of our training systems use nodes of five or more on a cane, a fruiting cane, and that's how we define the purpose of that cane. Now there's another way we can prune a cane. We can prune it to a spur. What is a spur? Well, it's when we prune that cane to retain four or fewer nodes. That's a spur. Well, there's various kinds of spurs. One of them is a fruiting spur. And a fruiting spur, by definition, is when its purpose is to create fruiting capacity for the vine. Well, here is a Cabernet Franc grapevine that has a cordon originating from two trunks and along that cordon are two to three node spurs and those spurs are for the purpose of creating fruiting capacity on the grapevine that's where the fruit is going to be produced so by definition these spurs are called fruiting spurs Now there are other options when we prune a cane to either a cane of five nodes or more or to a spur with four or fewer nodes. If we prune a cane to five or four nodes, it can be a fruiting cane as we have shown or it might be a trunk renewal cane because its principal purpose would be to begin the process of creating a new trunk for the vine. Here is a California vineyard with large old single trunk vines and in that climate that is often the case that trunks are established, they're not renewed for long periods of time, and this can be a problem or not depending upon how the rest of the vineyard is managed. In a cold climate or cool climate vineyard, if we have a single trunk vine, chances are it's going to have some winter injury in some year, it could happen every year, it could happen every five years or ten years, but somewhere along the way, that single trunk is going to get some injury from low winter temperatures. So this picture we're showing here is of 
a Cabernet Franc grapevine once again and the colored lines indicate that it has four trunks to sustain it so that none of the production of the vine is concentrated and dependent upon one single trunk. There, if we take the lines away you can see the four trunks better. Now this particular trunk is the oldest one on the vine and we might suspect that it is getting injury over the years that doesn't prevent it from performing completely but it is becoming perhaps less productive and especially if we look at that trunk as it goes up and turns into a cordon that cordon's getting old it's getting congested it's not doesn't have a nice neat uh, composition of canes along it so it might be time to replace that before it becomes more of a problem well here's how we do it we bring a cane as indicated with the yellow line up from in this case the graft union area above the graft union to start the process of renewing that trunk and replacing the old one with a young, healthier trunk with a cane from down low on the vine. There you can see it better. And in that case, that long cane, as would obviously be the, <laughs> the case with the terminology, we call that a trunk renewal cane. And at times you'll want to retain those on the vine to help keep your vines young and healthy. Now, to complete the story, there are other purposes for spurs, not just fruiting. And the renewal spur concept is extremely important to the pruner because it creates places on the vine where we get growth that we desire very much in the pruning process. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on this because it's a very important concept in pruning. So a renewal spur of four or fewer nodes occurs when its purpose is to create shoot growth in a desirable area of the grapevine. Let's show some examples of that. Well, here is a schematic drawing of the GEO training system as we presented to you in Grape Video 8. And we're going to talk about pruning, leaving this long fruiting cane along a bottom wire, and how we might go about it in a couple of different ways. We'll start with this Cabernet Front grapevine and the areas that we have colored here represent, for one, the magenta or purple area is a two-year-old trunk and it has growing on it two long canes that we've colored red and green. The yellow is a piece of twine that's holding that trunk up to a wire, at which you can't see. If we cut that portion of that grapevine out with the benefit of graphics and then use it to prune to the Guillot training system, we can demonstrate the need to create a spur below a fruiting cane. Let's start. We'll take off the tie that was there, the yellow twine tie and we'll put that section of a young trunk with two canes on it back on the GEO training system trellis as shown here. Let's make a couple of pruning cuts to demonstrate one way of pruning 
this young simple vine. We could use those two yellow marked areas to indicate pruning cuts and if we pruned in that way we would have the following. We would just leave the greenish colored cane at the top of the young trunk and we would tie it out that lower fruiting wire and it would look pretty much like the schematic drawing that we showed you like that. However, when we prune a grapevine we have to not only prepare it to perform in the upcoming growing season but we always want to be thinking of what will the form of the vine be in the years ahead. And the problem with this vine as we see it in this schematic is that all of the growth occurs right at the fruiting wire, the 30 inch fruiting wire. And because it occurs right at the 30 inch fruiting wire, it's going to be necessary to prune that vine at or above that wire in the following year. And one of the principles of pruning that we want to get across is to prepare the vine so that you're always pruning when you prune canes that they can be laid up and over wires from below those wires up and over and we always want to keep growth back into the central portion of the vine rather than having growth get further and further out the vine space and getting out of control. So if we prune the vine like this for this year, that's just fine for the upcoming growing season. But it's going to make it more difficult to prune that vine in the years ahead. So let's look at another approach to pruning that vine. We actually would like to have this short spur lower on the trunk so that the shoots that grow from those two buds or nodes on the sh short spur can be down lower, can be a source of canes in subsequent years and keep the shape of the vine under control. That's the renewal spur. The purpose of that short two node spur is not primarily for fruiting but to keep the shape of the vine. How do we go about doing that? Well let's go back to our other schematic. Here we are. This time we'll make different pruning cuts. We will not immediately use the green cane that was lower on the trunk for fruiting. No. We'll take the cane that was a little higher on the trunk, the red one, and we'll prune that for our fruiting cane and we will spur back, if you will, cut back short the green cane that is lower. And there's a third pruning cut just to shorten up that trunk uh, so that it gets back to where the cane is attached to the trunk. So if we make those three pruning cuts and we tie now the red cane out the wire, it'll look like this. There. And you see by doing that we create a spur further back down lower what we would often call behind the fruiting cane. So that's one of the principles of pruning. When you prune cane pruning, long cane pruning, always try to create a spur below a fruiting cane. We're going to show you some more of that. But this is important because if you don't do this, it won't be long before you will have difficulty maintaining your idealized training system that you've chosen when you're using long fruiting canes. And doesn't that look just like this schematic that we have created that two node spur behind or below the fruiting cane. 
and here it is in the vineyard. There's the fruiting cane, and over here in yellow is that spur that's below, behind, a little further down than the cane itself for fruiting. Okay, here's another situation. This is a young vine. This is actually a hybrid variety called Aurora or Cybel 5279. This picture was taken many, many years ago in the Finger Lakes region. And that young trunk is supporting two canes as we've outlined in red. Now, we actually would fruit those. Maybe they're going to be retained for a cordon, maybe not. Maybe they're going to be pruned back to canes every year. And off of those two canes are coming numerous shoots, and you can see the clusters developing. It's approaching the time of bloom. But if we just prune those canes like that and do nothing else on the vine, we're already getting growth up towards that fruiting moyer and we want to keep some reserve growth below and back more centralized. So the pruner has kept two spurs. They're not really visible in the picture, but they're there to create those extra shoots growing below the canes themselves, the fruiting canes themselves, so that most likely next year, the shoots that are growing from those spurs this year will become the fruiting canes if we choose to lay out new fruiting canes on that wire. And I hope that's uh, making sense to you, but it fulfills the intention of retaining a spur, a renewal spur in back of or below a fruiting cane. This is good pruning. Well, here's that schematic we've shown a number of times now of umbrella niffin training. And umbrella niffin training was presented to you in grape video 11. And we have the long fruiting canes that are arched up over fruiting wires and back down. But then, as indicated in this schematic, we have renewal spurs back in the middle of the vine below the fruiting canes to help retain the form of the vine. Here again is a picture of the long fruiting canes arching over wires using the umbrella niff and training system. But if we look back in the central head region of the vine on these vines, you'll see something like this. Ah, there's some great pruning. There, circled in yellow, are two wonderful renewal spurs that are going to be the future source of canes back in the central middle portion of the vine. Renewal spurs for the purpose of creating growth where you want it. And as you can already see, the growth of shoots from spurs like this is often very strong to make high quality fruiting canes the following year. Well, here's another approach with the use of a renewal spur. The circled area in yellow is a really sad piece of cordon that's gotten out of control. It's barely hanging on the wire and there's all kinds of random growth of canes coming from that section of cordon. And wouldn't it be nice to just get rid of that and get back to a more organized, younger uh, cordon along that section? Well, we can do that because the white arrow is pointing to a place back further lower on that trunk that is a renewal spur. If we take a closer look, there it is. 
there is a renewal spur that was kept intentionally and those two strong canes that develop from that renewal spur now allow us the opportunity to replace that old nasty gnarled cordon with a new young cordon. Let's take a look how we would do that. Once again there is the gnarled section of cordon and we've placed a yellow line to make a major pruning cut to cut all of that out. And then we're going to take this cane from the renewal spur and we're going to take it and lay it out the wire as the start of a new cordon. Well, yes, it's kind of sloppy graphics, but that's the best I could do. So we took some brown and we wiped out that old cordon area and we moved that red cane to indicate that we're going to tie it around that trellis wire to form a new cordon. And then there's one more cane that came off of that spur and just to keep some security down low in case something happens we'll make another pruning cut there and make a short renewal spur just for some further insurance policy on maintaining the form of the vine. So that is the use of a renewal spur to help replace an old section of cordon. And here's yet another use of a renewal spur. This is the base of a grapevine that has multiple trunks and you can see from lots of different pruning cuts this is a grapevine that gets frequent winter injury. It needs to have trunks renewed often to keep it healthy. And the pruner has elected instead of just pruning off a cane that originated in this area to spur it. And you can see the pruning cut at the top of that spur as it was created in within the yellow uh, area. We got these two very nice strong canes coming from that spur and either one of them will probably be a great candidate for a trunk renewal cane to bring up to get rid of old diseased trunks and start anew. So a renewal spur at the base of a grapevine to promote the growth of canes that may be used as a trunk renewal. Okay we've given you several examples of renewal spurs and we're going to define it once again as a short section of a cane retained on the vine for the purpose of creating desirable shoot growth in a certain area of the vine. And we showed you several examples of that. Please do keep this in mind as you prune a grapevine that you prepare the vine not just for the current year, but for the years after that. Now, it's possible to go spur crazy. It's possible to think that you need to retain spurs, renewal spurs, here and there and everywhere, and you can actually wind up leaving too many. So you'll have to learn that over time. Usually, we would like a renewal spur behind every long fruiting cane, if possible, and in other desirable locations, as you've seen. But don't think that you should leave renewal spurs for every cane that's on the vine and just wind up having it look like a porcupine. No, most of the time we're going to take most of the canes cleanly off the vine and only leave renewal spurs where they really make sense. And that's something that you can only gain appreciation for through experience as you go out and actually prune the grapevines. But do, do keep this important concept in mind when you take the shears in hand and go out to the vineyard to do good work. Okay, here's another aspect of pruning 
and the basic skills. When you prune a long cane, we advocate that you leave about a three-quarter inch length of inner node beyond the last bud or the last node on that cane. Why? You don't want a long section of inner node beyond that last bud because uh, you might be tempted to tie the cane to the wire in that inner node area beyond the bud and then it can slip out of whatever tying mechanism you have. So it forces you to tie in back of that last bud on the cane such as shown here this is actually stapling and I've grown fond of stapling uh, in some situations uh, as a way of tying canes to the wire I've grown fond of that in recent years but it also is far enough out away from that terminal bud so that it won't dry out the terminal bud will not dry out from that pruning cut uh, if it's out that far. If you prune very, very close to that terminal bud, um, it may not function at all, and that may not be desirable. So there you have that. Well, here's another basic pruning concept for grapevines, and it involves large diameter canes. First of all, let's say that we don't particularly choose to use large diameter canes unless we absolutely have to because they are less hardy than more moderate sized canes and it's often said to use pencil sized diameter or slightly larger canes and that's good advice but there are times when we have to use large diameter canes and there are ways to use them well and not so well so let's continue with the story we're going to outline the large diameter cane in red like this. And when that large diameter cane grows, it grows very vigorously. And it grows so vigorously that it will throw side shoots, or lateral shoots as we call them. And if those lateral shoots grow long enough, they will harden off and form woody lateral canes like these shown in yellow. So those are lateral canes. And what we're going to talk about is what do we do with this type of cane when we need to use it. Here is one option for the use of lateral canes on large diameter canes. When a shoot grows vigorously and ultimately becomes a large diameter cane and produces these persistent lateral canes, it turns out that the buds at the base of these lateral canes are actually quite inferior and underdeveloped so that if we were to take a large diameter cane and prune off all the lateral canes, we would wind up with a fruiting cane that is not very hardy and not very fruitful. So to overcome that, we leave these one or two bud lateral canes on the large diameter cane. And it turns out that the buds on the laterals are both rather hardy and rather fruitful. So this is a good thing. There's another picture of it. And when we prune that, we usually just count that whole complex as one bud. And you can see the bud starting to push on that one uh, spur uh, in the middle of the picture. Now, another way of using a strong lateral cane is to extend the primary cane because actually the nodes on that lateral are typically more hardy and quite fruitful compared to those on the primary cane. So I'm going to do a rather crude cut and paste here. And I've bent over the one strong lateral cane that I had on this 
strong primary cane. And we'll do this. Can you tell that I've kind of pasted over? Yeah, well, that's just to try to give you the idea that if we cut off the end of the primary cane and extended instead the lateral cane to finish out your long cane pruning, that's a very good pruning technique because those nodes on that lateral are both hardy and fruitful relative to those on the primary cane. I'm trying to show this uh, with a couple of photos. You can see that on this cane we have a lateral that's been spurred and see how nice and strong the shoot growth is of those two shoots on that lateral spur. And in comparison, the shoots coming out on that primary cane are weaker. They may be secondary or tertiary shoots uh, because the primary shoot may not have developed at all. So there's an example of how much better the nodes on laterals can be. And whenever you can, spur those. Don't cut them off completely. And here's another picture of the same thing. You can see that there's a fairly long lateral spur off of this large diameter cane. And it's got nice strong shoot growth. And there's another spur at the very top of the picture with just one shoot showing. And all of those shoots developing from those spurs are moving along better. They look healthier and more fruitful. Um, they are likely to be than the shoots on that large diameter primary cane. So this is what a good pruner does. A good pruner takes advantage of those laterals as they occur on large diameter canes whenever you need to prune those as part of your process in the vineyard. The next topic we're going to talk about in pruning is to prune to maintain healthy productive cordons. And as a refresher, a cordon is a special kind of arm for a grapevine that is positioned horizontally along and or around a trellis wire. So here we have some big old cordons in a California vineyard. And we're going to talk about various situations that occur that suggest it's time to renew the cordon. Okay, let's go back to this photo of a cordon on a Cabernet Franc grapevine because it illustrates a fairly young, healthy cordon. The ideal cordon would have spurs situated about every five inches, and that's about the case here. And each of those spurs, if it had two nodes that develop, would give about the right shoot density for an ideal canopy which we tend to think of as about five shoots per foot of row. And this spacing of spurs along this young cordon is just about right to achieve that shoot density. Well, here's one thing that can go wrong with the cordon. Over time, we get a barren section of cordon where we have no shoots coming from no spurs, and we have a big gap. And we can't make up for that just by loading up other parts of the cordon with more buds from longer spurs because we'll just get a shoot density in one part of the trellis that's excessive, causes shading, and we won't get good production of fruit. So when we see a portion of a cordon that has become barren, if you will, that's a suggestion it's time to renew the cordon. And we've shown a picture somewhat like this before 
what a mess this looks like an octopus all the different base buds that came out and this even doesn't look like a cordon anymore it's half falling off the wire there have been so many different base shoots and there's just canes coming out here and there and everywhere there's no orderly arrangement of spurs fruiting spurs along this section of cordon so it's time to do something to renew that section of cordon and over time wires will get embedded in cordons and if you're not careful they can get so very very deeply embedded that you'll have to cut the cordon and the wire out everything and start all over again so uh, we're going to talk a little more about that in just a minute, but when you see a situation developing where the cordon is starting to become embedded into the wire or the vice versa, this makes uh, the case for cordon renewal. And to say the obvious, here is the crown gall disease coming up right to and starting out a cordon area along a, uh, a wire. And uh, that certainly, uh, without even saying, uh, suggests we better get rid of this as early as we can, as soon as we can. Now, let's talk about this situation. I call this situation climbing spurs. Climbing spurs are when you have a fruiting spur along a cordon and then the next year you fruit off of that. In this case, the green line represents what was an original fruiting spur on this cordon. And then the next year, a spur was spurred off of that and that's the yellow line. And then the next year, the red line was a spur off of the yellow spur and this year if we continue we will actually spur that uh, cane that's represented by the blue line and what happens then and you can see other examples of it as you look uh, to the left of of the uh, colored spurs what happens over time is that the fruiting canes that you are working with climb higher and higher and get away from the cordon itself and that changes the whole arrangement on the vine. Now if we cut like this this year with those two pruning cuts that's not going to help us. It's just continuing the problem with getting higher and higher away from the cordon wire. Well, here we are back at this picture of a cordon in a California vineyard. And can you see some of the examples of what I've just been saying? You can see some vines where there's big barren areas that aren't going to be productive anymore. In all cases, we have climbing spurs, not too bad, but they're getting further and further away from the cordon and that's going to change the whole way we can manage the shoot growth in the vineyard. So this vineyard should have had cordon renewal a long long time ago. The best way to do that is to renew both the cordon and the trunk from the ground at the same time. And we're back to this picture with a young trunk and we're looking where that trunk that was a cane renewal a year ago now has two canes at the top this is what we used in our example of cane pruning earlier in the video and the arrow is pointing to the place where the lowest cane on that young trunk exists so we would use that to cut out the oldest trunk and renew the cordon to make it young and productive again. Now when you renew a cordon like that, and this 
cane is now being laid out, a trellis wire in cordon renewal. We advocate that you don't get carried away with wrapping the cane around the wire. That will just hasten the embedding of the wire in the cordon, and it makes it much more difficult to get the cordon off the wire uh, at some time in the future. So we suggest wrapping the cane around a wire like this no more than one rotation every 18 inches and sometimes less. There are also techniques, I haven't used them, of just hanging a cane from the wire and not rotating it around at all. But I have no personal experience with that. But it sounds like a good thing to do. And when you do that, and we have growth for a year, it might wind up the next year looking like this. Here's now a very young cordon that was a cane laid out that wire the previous year. And you can see we now have nice, healthy, good-sized canes around five to six inches apart all along that young cordon. This is a nicely spaced canes along a new cordon. This would be the ideal. And from there we could go on and spur those canes uh, into fruiting spurs and we could do that for three, four, five years until things start to climb and get too far, too high, and then we renew that cordon again. When pruning grapevines, then, do keep in mind the following. Pruning cuts. Be mindful that the way you make pruning cuts will have a huge influence on how many shoots start to grow in the spring and where they grow. So be a good pruner and make good, clean pruning cuts. Renewal spurs. Very important in many situations, as we talked about. Be mindful of their value and use them whenever it makes sense to create areas of growth on the vine. Trunk renewal canes, especially in our cold climate vineyards, we must renew trunks periodically to keep them healthy so the vine is productive. So be mindful of retaining trunk renewal canes whenever necessary to keep trunks young and healthy. The use of lateral canes on big diameter canes, we talked about that, to make use of those and to not just quickly prune off all the laterals and maintain just a large diameter cane. That is not to your best advantage. And then cordon renewal, we just talked about if you're using a training system that utilizes a cordon don't allow those cordons to get too many years old before you renew them or the process becomes so difficult you just tend to put it off another year and another year and another year until you really have a huge job on your hands. So those are the building blocks of pruning and we'll hope that in our next videos you'll keep them in mind as we look to specific situations on how we're going to prune grapevines. Until then, happy grape growing, and thank you for your attention.